Well, Joyce and I just uh, celebrate our 33rd wedding anniversary. And we've actually been living together for 34 years. I just called to my attention that the most important person in my life, the previous 24 years, was uh, Joe Matthews. Mm. And I first met Joe Matthews in, uh, when I was in college. He, he came doing a religious emphasis week at uh, Oklahoma State University. And uh, I was already kind of an uh, active person in the Methodist student movement, uh, an officer in the state structure, president of the state structure, went to conferences around and, and had some spiritual awakenments of some sorts, uh, you know, with the study of mathematics and physics and Einsteinian things and hypnotism and the uh, New Testament, especially for Sermon on the Mount somehow. So I was thinking about the ministry instead of a mathematics career before he showed up, but his charisma in that time just settled my decision where I went to seminary. I was going to go to Perkins School of Theology where he was teaching. And so I began there in 53. Uh, and Frank Hilliard was my roommate uh, that first year. And then I married my first wife. Uh, but my uh, work with Joe Matthews was, uh, for 24 years, just more really central in my life. Uh, and seminary was a time in which uh, uh, I was not only his student, I was, became a friend. And he would use some of us to help him teach classes in the, my senior time there. And uh, then when I left the seminary, I had to go in the Army as a chaplain for a while. But even then, I kept track with the Christian Faith and Life community where Joe was. And, uh, and uh, then when they went to Chicago, uh, I, I jo joined them. I, was, I, was, I and my first wife and children were the first interns uh, in the Order Ecumenical. It was just, just forming in, in Evanston, Illinois. And uh, Joe Matthews was living in the coal bin. That's what I was looking for. In the basement of this big house where everybody else was living. There were nine families of us in, in total. And he uh, divided the, and he and Lynn, Evanston, Illinois, he and Lynn divided the coal bin in half uh, for Ruth and I to live in the other half of it. Uh, so that was my introduction to the new religious order. Uh, and we, <laughs> that was a wonderful experience for me uh, because I was learning to teach from great teachers like Joe Matthews and Joe Slicker and others who had already been teaching these uh, wonderful curricula for a long time. And uh, so I, I spent the next uh, 24 years uh, working in that religious order. Uh, and my main forte was becoming a teacher of these methods. And uh, Joe Matthews was the kind of creative person that he just kept inventing things, inventing things, inventing more things. And, and I became Dean of the Academy, they called it, uh, which was an eight-week residential program that uh, taught everything, practically, that had been researched up to that time uh, to uh, 100 to 200 uh, students on an eight-week eight basis. And so I, I had the wonderful position of playing the role of taking all this wonderful stuff uh, Joyce, I mean, Matthews, uh, created. <laughs> And tried to boil it down to curriculum that could be taught uh, in this uh, in this program. Uh, and uh, then I, I met Joyce in the latter end of this time, and she was one of the teachers of that uh, academy with me. And uh, then, since leaving the order in '76, uh, I began living with Joyce, and uh, then she's been my main mentor since Matthews died. Uh, and uh, so I, I divide my life into three parts, before Joe Matthews, during Joe Matthews, and, and with Joyce. Uh, what year was that that you moved to Evanston? 62. That was in 62. Okay. All right. Very helpful. And so, Joyce, how did, how did you enter the, when did you enter the picture and begin? Well, I, I ran into the Ecumenical Institute through RS1 in 1971. Actually, I... Um, I was going to the Methodist church. I married a Methodist. 
<coughs> and they had a new Methodist curriculum at one point. And I don't know if you all remember that. It was in the 60s. <coughs> I think it was about 64. And that's where I met Paul Tillich. Was in that uh, new curriculum, and there was something about the virgin birth. And I remember, I was a Sunday school teacher of young people, but there were some of us teachers who met together uh, to do this new curriculum, not on Sunday at another time. And uh, some of them were very upset with me because I was really getting, digging into this stuff, you know, and, and asking a lot of questions that were uncomfortable for people. So I went to the small public library, it was in Roswell, New Mexico, and I found everything by Tillich and everything else on that shelf. There was some Altizer and other things too, and it's like, wow. And what, what year was that? Well, 60, I think it was like 64, 65, okay. something right. like that. Mm -hmm. my, my copy of Tillich's sermons uh, that I bought for myself were dated 1968. Mm -hmm. That's when I bought those. So uh, I was into that sort of thing. So then we'd moved to Amarillo, where my husband was music director of Polk Street Methodist, big Methodist church in Amarillo. And uh, the, you may know Tom Hostot. He was the uh, director of the symphony, the Amarillo mm -hmm. Symphony. And he was closely connected to the institute. And he set up a lot of RS1 courses in the Amarillo area. So in 1971, one of my friends in the church who knew that I always upset people in Sunday school classes asking questions. She said, I think you'd like this course. So I went to this RS1 course. Well, by that time, I'd about decided maybe I'm an atheist. And so I was just kind of like Alan was smiling all through the symposium. I was smiling all through this course. I just loved it. And it was like, wow, here's some people that not only see all this stuff, they understand it, but they put it together and lived out of it all these years. There's a whole community of them. Wow, wow, wow. I was just so excited. So um, then in 72, oh, they moved to Religious House, Stamro, and that was another boon for me. And so I was over there at 6 every morning doing their pedagogy, blah, 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 whatever they had. I was there. Ecclesiola's on Wednesday night. And then uh, in 72, uh, the Grahams, I can't think, Stuart and you may know Graham's young couple that were there at the house came over to visit me and convinced me I should go to academy. It was the first thing I ever did that my husband vetoed and I did it anyway. I was on a plane, I went to Chicago and spent a month in the ghetto that was at the program center there uh, in the Fifth City area. It was big building. Was 1972. 72. I did the first month, I think it was fall of 72. And uh, actually I didn't meet Gene at that time. He was in Australia uh, doing the ITIs. And John Baggett was dean. Uh, Stanfield was there and Shropshire, and met all them. And 200, about 250 people from all over the world in this ghetto and rats and all. And I loved it. When I went back to our house in Amarillo, it just seemed like a palace and I, I couldn't stand being so indulged. I just loved living there in the ghetto in my little cot and other cots stacked around, you know, and just the blankets separating. It was just fantastic. Doris Hahn was just uh, a saint to me. I, I just sat and ate up everything she said. Uh, so that was, uh, when I came back from Academy, I just felt like that I used to sink into things that went clear to the bottom, but after Academy there was something that stopped right here. You know, it's like, I don't know how, that's how I experienced it in my body, that uh, there was just something solid there. And then I did the second month of Academy the next spring uh, of 73, and I, that's when I met you, and by then it was over at, uh, it was still in Fifth City, but it was over at the seminary. Uh, Bethany, whatever that whole, had the gymnasium where we had the balls and all the different, we had the, or maybe it was, no, it was, the, it was the chapel where we had the balls and the gymnasium where we had daily office, you know, and all the, oh, I love daily office. I would go home after academy and I would do it by myself. I just missed it, so I, I just ate it up. This stuff was just like manna to me. And so I did meet Jean there, 
I don't know that he really knew who I was exactly, but then in 70, I got a divorce then in 75. It was clear for many years that my husband and I were definitely on different tracks and this sort of solidified it for me. And uh, then I guess it was at a summer program, probably 75 summer program that uh, later in 75 that Nancy Lanfear suggested to you that uh, I might be someone to be on academy staff mm -hmm. and you and I met. That's when we, I guess we had known each other sort of in the other academies that I attended, but we, you wanted me to come and teach on academy staff. And uh, Nancy, she was at, she and Fred were at the Amarillo house at the time. Mm -hmm. So I say I was at the house a lot. In fact, I lived at the house for a while. I, I wasn't in the order, but I lived at the house. Definitely a part of the cadre. And so we taught together on academy staff, uh, oh, three or four times, I guess. Uh, I helped move, helped them when we moved the academy over to Kemper. And we taught it over there. And uh, Gene and I became, he and Brian Stanfield and I were just, we were like the three on the staff that we'd get together and talk things over and work things out. We just uh, clicked together. We became really close colleagues and very good friends. And then at one point, we decided we maybe wanted to be together longer than that. Well, I, I can't speak for the general, but for myself, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church and a great gift in many ways and uh, of course many shortcomings as well that I discovered but when I attended that first RS1 it was like I can be religious and live in this world, this modern world and ask all the questions, have all the doubts that I have, I can be intellectually honest I don't have to dumb down my mind. I don't have to manipulate my emotions. I can be absolutely real and still be religious. And that was just a gift beyond compare for me. Well, when I came to seminary in, in Perkins School of Theology in 53, I was, I was already in motion in a way. Uh, I had been a mathematician and physicist in college and I experienced myself in seminary as the only person there who had the foggiest idea about the shift from Newtonian to Einsteinian physics. I mean, I was just a complete outsider with that regard. I also had a, a strong scientific bent. I mean, I knew how the scientific method worked. It was just still surprising to me how few people in the whole culture still have very little grasp of the scientific method. So I, I ate up that part of the seminary training and and meeting Joe Matthews in seminary was just an unbelievable experience. It was like a war going on between old-style liberalism, very sentimental, very moralistic, and just the thunder that was coming from Joe Matthews and Edward Hobbs and a few other people that were there redoing this seminary. So I was swept up into a revolution in that seminary. And the things that were impressive to me was um, just a new understanding of God. I mean, just the... Uh, radical uh, understanding that what you're up against is what you're up against is what you're up against is what you're up against and that uh, God is uh, a mystery you never understand and, and that your first response to this absolute mystery is, is terror and, and flight uh, uh, but uh, trust this real life as your best case scenario is, is what Christianity and ancient Judaism was fundamentally about. To just get that straight was a, a deliverance from a lot of sentimentality uh, and life after death hopes and other things that uh, dropped away. And then freedom became, I think, the, the next big issue that really captivated me, uh, that we just were free, that we just do have the responsibility. Uh, a few years later, I wrote a little poem about this that was published in the letter of, that they published at the Christian Faith and Life Community that had this verse in it. God waits to decide what the future will be until you decide who you will be now. 
And so this sense of this great weight of significance placed upon each of us in the decisions that we make. Of course, that grounded in the existential theology and so forth uh, was just revolutionary. I started writing my first book at that time. It's called The, 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 the Free Man or something like this. <laughs> I never finished that book, but I had a whole bunch of notes. Uh, and I was trying to show that well, I, you don't want to know all that. Anyway, anyway <laughs> it was uh, just a big thing. And then, of course, when I got into the order in, in, uh, in Chicago, every summer was a kind of a uplifting, uh, a creative event put together mainly by Joe Matthews. But, of course, he included a lot of the rest of us in figuring it out. But it was his drive that made every summer uh, a, a new rocket boost. And what I mean by rocket boost, it was at the spirit level. Uh, I, I think especially of the summer when we were again dealing with prayer, with uh, meditation, contemplation, and prayer. But it was prayer, I think, that really got me because in the new theolo theolo theology, it was difficult to recover my kneeling at the altar back at the Messy Foundation and, and MYF. Uh, we... I, so I thought, knew how to pray back then, but learning that prayer had to do with this freedom, that prayer was a, an exercise of your freedom, that the whole meaning of prayer throughout the whole history of the church had been getting your intentions out, uh, your intentions to be grateful, your intentions to fess up to life as you experienced it, and your refusal to live life as it was, and your decisions for your own life, and your decisions for other people's lives, that this was what prayer was. So I was delivered back to some kind of solitary exercise. And of course, meditation filled this out. What meditation meant to us at the time was the people we, had, we dialogue with. Of course, I was already in very intense dialogue with Matthews and Kierkegaard and H. Richard Niebuhr and Bonhoeffer and Tillich people like that. But to see that I had a council going on in my head all the time between all the great people in my life that had ever made any impact on me and that this paying attention to these dialogues in the depths of my life uh, was another kind of solitary practice that enabled me to be more than just one little opinion, but uh, be a part of a great, uh, how would you say it, communion of saints through the ages <laughs> who, who uh, rap grappled with what it means to be a human being. So all of this was a real uplift in my solitary practice and, and contemplation was a little slower and comes later but I'll talk about that because I've really learned contemplation at, under Joyce's tutelage uh, in all our work with Buddhism and so forth. Well, he, uh, he might have been an actor if he hadn't been a theologian uh, because he was, he was a stage performer. Uh, I first encountered this in seminary. I mean, he would stand up on the desk in the front of the room and hang on an imaginary skyhook to satirize the kind of otherworldly thinking that was going on in the room. Or if someone asked a question like, uh, well, if I believe that, I would leave the ministry. He would walk over to the front door of the classroom and open it up and stand there with the door open. Uh, he is just a no-nonsense kind of person. I mean, he just drove for the juggler on almost every sentence. And his talks and workshops and so forth were, were always online. When he did a, work, a, a fireside chat at some campus or something like that, he, he was just amazing. I mean, some kid would raise a question in the back of the room, you know, about something. He would make an uh, event out of it. Uh, and. And the guy would never forget that this is what happened uh, to him for months after that, probably, or maybe forever. Well, it was that way all the time. And uh, also what he had a, a, an understanding of was, was the communal nature of Christianity. Uh, and this, this has been forgotten by many people. Uh, we, Christianity has become very individualistic, uh, both uh, fundamentalists waiting around to go to their individual soul to go somewhere, hopefully, or, or liberal Christians just interested in their own moral quality or some 
little peaceful state of mind or something. But no, Christianity is a community uh, event. Uh, and I've since come to understand that the resurrection in Christian heritage was the birth of a community uh, who embodied the Jesus reality. Uh, Matthews was clear about this kind of thing and, and organizing an order of people and creating practices that uh, made intimacy and spiritual reality happen among people. This was one of his genius things that carried him beyond, I think, uh, what he'd learned in seminary into the raw research and, and invention out of uh, nowhere uh, into the kinds of new life practices and methods. Perhaps his most important contribution is uh, methodology. Although you could say another one was pulling together things because he, he pulled together four or five great theologians into a, his own way of uh, accessing uh, uh, Christian theology and history. Uh, and he pulled together science and religion and science and psychology and science. and uh, He was a, a much more amazingly intelligent and creative person than would appear. He just seemed like an ordinary Joe who could go out into the fifth city or somewhere and, and talk to uh, children uh, or, or, or people that weren't religious or weren't his color or whatever, but uh, behind all that was a lot of substance. And, uh, and he was a great scholar in his way, even though he wasn't a uh, published scholar. He, he, he studied the people who were. The community uh, element of Christianity and what Matthews did was create a community, and that was so important. And the methods were a part of that, were such a part of the community. It was a community with methods. In fact, I, that's how I think of the order in many ways. It's a community with methods to uh, express, to show the gospel. and. Uh, it just occurred to me while you're doing that, what we're doing now is creating community, but we're not creating an order. He created an order. We're creating community of small groups uh, with methods right, to express the gospel. Yeah, that reminds me of my journey of becoming a teacher because in the first year of trying to be a teacher of this style. I just copied people. I mean, if Matthew stuttered, I stuttered. You know, whatever it was, uh, however things were said, if he read poetry this way, I read it this way. Which was a great thing because it got you inside the feel of where this person was coming from. But eventually I had to give that up. I had to uh, come from my own feel and, and, and sort of create my own personal jargon, I suppose. But at any rate, be more authentically me and more willing to create new things and borrow new things from a wider spectrum of people. But some people I knew were slower than me doing this. <laughs> so that did become an issue for some people is how not to just be out there aping words, but uh, genuinely speaking from your own life about your own experience. Uh, yeah, I think like that's still an issue. The jargon, yeah, the jargon is a. Uh a way for a community to talk to one another and, and get clear about what they're talking about. But at some point, if you don't internalize it and just start using your own words and your own experience and, and let go of any, it, you haven't really got it. It's not really real for you. Jean and I have an agreement that every morning from 5 to about 7.30, we do not talk to each other, basically. Uh, I stay back in my office or the bedroom area, and he comes either to the living room or his office, and we have our solitary time. And he can talk about what he does. But I uh, meditate, uh, pray. Uh, right now I'm doing the Ignatian retreat processes, journal, and read. Uh, I'm reading Thomas Merton's journals, which just are great for me, and I always have a stack of books and reading from, I'm also reading a book on forgiveness for the second time, because that's a big issue for me. I'm not a very good forgiver. <laughs> but um, 
when you were talking about prayer as freedom, I, I had a little disagreement with that. Uh, to me, I guess prayer is, uh, I know in the order they talked about meditation more as having your meditative counsel, and contemplation was what we talk about now more as meditation. To me, meditation is a kind of prayer. It's the Buddhist kind of meditation or contemplation. Uh, the beingness, getting in touch with your being and opening yourself to uh, the wholeness of uh, reality and the spiritual dimension. Uh, and prayer, I, I love the confession, gratitude, petition and intercession thing. Sometimes I use those con self-consciously. Sometimes I just pray. A lot of my praying I do in my journal. And uh, I say, dear God. I use the word God. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend it for someone who's still a literalist, but I, I use the word God. And, and, and the Ignatian uh, retreat is great for just having these conversations, just talk like person to person. And that's the way I pray, is person to person. And sometimes it's really angry, and uh, sometimes it's very grateful, and it's in all kinds of things begging, pleading, whatever. Uh, and usually God doesn't answer. There's usually the silence is the answer. <laughs> when I have these conversations in the, the retreat that are coming up between Mary and uh, me and, and Jesus and I, we, we have a conversation. But usually there's the silence of God and you just put it out there. But uh, I did a, a research project on prayer. Ben Ball was interested in that, and he and I were exploring that, and I looked up everything I could find from way back when on down through, and what I discovered is nobody knows the fuck what prayer is. You know, just, <laughs> everybody comes at it differently, so you might as well just do whatever you call prayer. And I, I love James Cars. He said, you know, if you're talking, you're praying. You're praying, please listen. And, and so it just any, and when you're, and when I'm journaling, that, that's got to be prayer. I'm not writing for a newspaper. I'm really, I feel like everything I write in my journal is to the whatever, the mysterious whatever. I'm very interested right now in building a little talk, actually, on the, the difference between Christianity and Buddhism and its basic metaphor. And the basic metaphor of Christianity and Judaism is I vow, or intimacy. Intimacy in the sense that not only am I relating to you as a vow, but you are an I relating back to me as a vow. And, and to be aware of this I'll vow, vow, I'll vow, vow a nature of an interpersonal relationship between awake people is the basic metaphor of Christianity and Judaism. Uh, and so we have a kind of a we uh, experience in the human to human intimacy and then we have a we-thou relationship with the almighty power of uh, being. And uh, this is the primary metaphor of Judaism and Christianity, as Martin Buber pointed out, and, and many others. When you move over into, into, into Buddhism, uh, that is not as prominent. I mean, there are Buddhists that pray to the Buddha and pray to this and that. And of course, a lot of more prayer in Hinduism. And, but. Uh, the main metaphor in these Eastern religions is enlightenment, inquiry, consciousness, discovering consciousness. So you're, you're, you're focused in, interiorly. You're not focused on intimacy. You're focused on the, the subjective, learning to be objective about its own subjectivity. You're, the subject and the object are the same thing because the object of your contemplation is the subject doing the observing. So the observing and the subject and the other are all one thing. And in doing so, you are also observing being as a whole, of which you are an inseparable part. So there's a kind of experience of oneness. It, it occurs in Hinduism as the Atman being the, the, uh, the, the great self and the Brahman being the finalist of being. But the key experience in Hindu philosophy is that the Atman and the Brahman are one. That I am. 
Uh, now that's an entirely different metaphor. But, but you step back, it's just a metaphor. It's just another way of, 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 of letting your fragile mind imagine the in unfathomability of spirit. So you have this mind of spirit discovery and this mind of spirit discovery. And they're neither one better than the other. They're neither one more limited than the other. They're just simply different. And yet, they're, if, if you experiment in doing them both, you find that they're both after the same essential quality of being a human being. And uh, so your solitary offices are methods to help you do that. And I think each person has to kind of work that on their own. My, my experience with solitary time is, is a very fancy form of journaling, mostly, uh, which is pre, pre built into by meditative reading. I do some meditation. Uh, I do some praying, in, in effect. Uh, my prayers sort of drift off into list making, <laughs> but but that's a, a kind of prayer. I mean, it's. it's this is what I'm going to do this week and, and, and get it written down so I don't forget I've done it, decided to do it. Uh, but the key thing is inquiring into what's so. And I've had a lot of help from A.H. Almos. I'm rereading my, my Almos stuff. Uh, and I'm reading for the first time stuff by a Buddhist teacher, a bachelor. I'm reading now a book, Living with the Devil. This. This overlaps with uh, Almas because both of them are very clear that the devil is your own personality. It's your habits that you've built up since infancy and your their who you think you are habit, which we usually call ego. Uh, this thing you have designed yourself to believe is you, which is not you because you've designed it. And the real you is something beyond your designing. And the real you is much more fabulous and overwhelmingly mysterious than the you you think you are. So the devil is who you think you are and this pattern of habits that you've built up since childhood. This is, this is the tempter that's constantly going to tempt you into being less than you are. So living with the devil means you're never going to get out of this predicament because having a personality is absolutely essential for adulthood. Having some picture of yourself is, is uh, useful, but it's not who you are. And uh, so uh, if you're not able to have distance, detachment from your habits and your self-image, uh, you are not even close to being a spiritual person. You have to be willing to open up from that and let reality bigger than your habits, bigger than your self-image in. Uh, and then, if, as need be, recreate your habits and recreate your self-image. Really, I, what you're creating is just your own little fragile creation that who you really are and who life really is is f f unfathomable. You are no closer to it than you ever were. But that's, that's the kind of emphasis that I'm having in my meditations and, and readings because I, I think this is the real edge for our culture, and, and it's, it's, it's an exploration into being. Uh, and it's a, it's a spirit journey that everybody's on to an extent that they, they don't know they're on, I think. That we're all uh, pretty much locked into our personalities and just acting them out or reacting from the basis of them. Uh, and to stop this game of just ricocheting around and inquiring into who we really, truly are and what we really, truly want to do with our one life. This is an interruption that uh, too few people in our culture are willing to stand. Because it's scary. It, it means experiencing a void. Uh, the void of who I think I was isn't who I is. Uh, uh, the void of I'm not just a shy person. I'm just a bunch of shy habits. Uh, I'm not just a person who flies off the handle. I'm a person who is habituated to fly off the handle uh, <laughs> and whatever your patterns are. Anyway, that's been a very valuable uh, description, I think, of where I am in my spiritual practice at the moment.
Well, I have my favorite little myth is, is that the human consciousness began when this little group of hominids were running across the desert and one of their leaders fell dead. And they began performing a little circle around this event. Uh, and while they were doing this circle, one person on one side of the circle looked into the eyes of somebody on the other side of the circle and realized that this circling stood for this experience of loss. That was the first liturgy, and we, we added language and, and art uh, to elaborate it, and humanity began. Well, I think mythology has, has been confused because people think mythology has to mean uh, worlds of gods and angels and, and devils and evil spirits and good spirits. And, in other words, the two-story worldview mythology is what mythology is and everything else is something else. But mythology is just simply story, just any kind of story that accesses the spirit depths. And it may not have these supernatural elements in it. And even when it does have these supernatural elements in it, you must think of it as just a story. This was just the way that people for thousands of years storied, was, was talking about their depth interior life with these fantasy figures of angels and devils and so forth. But, but you don't understand at all what they were doing if you don't see that those were just symbols for things that were actually happening in their lives. So for we modern people who f find that too easy to literalize, we have to think of ways of speaking what we might call existentially or phenomenologically uh, about, it, about those stories or write new stories that, that, that are uh, not uh, flawed, you might say, with that uh, old two-story uh, way of thinking about it. Uh, that actually say the same thing uh, to us about our interior life as the old two stories do. And once you've done a little bit of that kind of translating back and forth, that opens up for you the whole of history. You, you can then see that whether well, they were Greeks talking about uh, uh, Aphrodite or whether they were Buddhists or Hindus or Christians talking about devils and, and God, uh, they were talking about the same thing you can talk about in other ways uh, through phenomenological and existential language today. Teaching someone else is a very individual process. I don't know how to generalize on it. Uh, but I do know how to give a sermon on any topic out of the whole Bible. Just give me any verse you want to. Uh, let, let's take uh, something like uh, walking on the water. Well, you just tell that wonderful story about Jesus and Peter and all those guys. And then you make it clear that they were in their safe boat. And what is your safe boat, you know, and get out all the safe boats that you live in in your life and how walking on the wild waters of life is scary when you have to leave your safe boat. And, here Jesus is already out there walking on the water, and he says, well, come on then. You can see, you can get existential in a hurry with any one of those stories. Uh, and I, just, I have a lot of favorites because they're very easy to tip over. But that's a nice experience. I've done sermons like that in a lot of churches where they've never had any experience with this at all. And I can have 90% of the people there on the edge of their seat wanting to hear this way of looking at that, I've never looked at that story that way before, kind of awe. Uh, and uh, I think people just have to go through a number of experiences and they begin to get it. That, that's what I've noticed uh, in our circles. We, we do that with the Bible every night. I think more in terms of methods. Gene thinks about sermons. I think about methods and like a Bible conversation. You have a very simple method of a Bible conversation you ask people, you read some short little piece, you ask them what they heard, and they tell you, and then you ask them uh, 
what struck them about it. You know, you get, get their feeling about it. And then you ask them what, uh, uh, how it addressed them, you know, what, what it how it challenges them in their lives. And so if they try to get into their literalistic stuff, you just keep coming back to the simple question, you know, how is that for you in your life? So that they're just grounding stuff in their life rather than doing interpretations. Just let it, use simple methods that just get down to people's real lives. I, I think we actually translate it into uh, things with which we're most familiar, which has the effect of making us familiar with that language. I think uh, Joyce talked about methodology in doing so. I think that's probably the best way because what you're really doing is letting the group uh, experience demythologizing or, or, or changing the language or, or relating the old stories of the Bible to their stories uh, in their current uh, way of talking about their own lives. So that's really a, a kind of sermon building as a group. That's what, uh, uh, so the group builds through those methods, builds their own translation of that scripture uh, in terms of their own life experiences. Now, if I'm giving a talk, I'm doing the same thing as I feel. I'm, I'm taking that scripture and performing those methods in my own being before them. I mean, I'm, I'm translating uh, these verses of scripture into verses that I imagine might register with their lives. Uh, so uh, uh, something like that is, 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 is the key, I think, is, is getting people to realize there wasn't anything wrong with these people that had this two-story language. That was just their way of talking. But it is not our way of talking anymore. And it's really not even a good way of talking when we take it literally. It means that we don't really have any grasp of what they were doing with it. And we're not doing anything with it that, 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 that's, uh, that's not just foolishness. So you've got to translate in order to understand and appreciate these great ancient saints as well as appreciate yourself as a saint on the same level as they were. They don't have any magic we don't have. They, they were just talking about their lives with their language. Now we're talking about our lives with our language and we can have this communication across the centuries. I think everybody uh that asked that question, they wouldn't ask it if they didn't realize there's something to their lives that is uh, deeper than uh, the job, making a living, buying clothes, just the ordinary run of the things that they, they want something that is more real, that is deep in their lives. Uh, they realize, uh, and I guess I would say, you know, we all realize at some level that uh, life is mysterious. We don't know for sure how we got here. We know we're going to leave, and we don't know when. And uh, in my understanding of spirit, a lot of it has to do with making decisions around that, how I relate to that fact that I don't control, ultimately, the big things that happen to me in life. And uh, a person to me, that is spiritual is someone who's decided that I will trust, have trust in this mysterious aspect of life that brings my life and takes it away, causes me to age and suffer ill health and losses and other things as well as great joy. The choice to live it in trust is to live in a kind of spirit depth. One of the great things that Joe Matthews did for me was get me started on a comprehensive answer to that question. Uh, his first way of getting me started was with the contemplation, meditation, contemplation, and prayer talks, which were also poverty, chastity, obedience, transparent knowing, transparent being, and transparent doing. These talks were on many states of being, all of which were, were the answer to the question spirit. And then he sort of erased the board and, and did uh, the mountain of, the, 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 the land of mystery, the river of consciousness, the uh, mountain of care, and the sea of tranquility. Again, 64 
answers to your question, <laughs> what is spirit? And when I began uh, doing systematic answering of that question, I started with the, the, what they call the other world charts of mountain of care, uh, river of consciousness, uh, and so forth, and took, put those very states of being into relationship to the, what I was doing, and I found I, I like the model I'm working with now that answers that question, and it can all boil down to these three words, trust, love, and freedom. Uh, and so when someone says, what's spirit? Well, it's trust, love, and freedom. Well, what's trust, love, and freedom? Well, it's, and I have this broken down to infinity. Uh, so I can give as long a talk as you want on that subject. You can even write a book on that subject. Several. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Joyce is what she says is, is a better answer because it's more, more, direct, more direct to the point. But, but I think people recognize that spirit, or another thing you can say about spirit is those who say don't know and those who know don't say. Because really your, your spirit is unspeakable. Uh, a person cannot understand at all what you're talking about unless they are experiencing it. Because the words are just words flying around. But if these words are used in such a way as that it occasions in the other person their own experience of that same thing, then they can say, aha! Uh, the, the spirit is then a direct experience on the interior rather than just uh, an answer to some questions out here abstractly. So.